gunman who robbed a Lehigh Acres motel. Police say it was on November 22nd that they rushed into the microtel on Business Way and started demanding money. Moments later, police say one of them jumped the counter, stole money from the register, and an employee's purse before taking off. If you know anything, if you recognize the people in these images, you are asked to call Crime Stoppers and you don't have to give your name. French police evacuated people from Paris's Louvre Museum and rapidly secured the area after an attack by a man armed with a machete. The attack took place in a shopping mall outside the Louvre, one of the most visited museums in the world. About a thousand people inside were moved to safe areas. Police say they haven't identified the man or established a motive. A second person was arrested, but it's unclear whether they were linked to the incident. Some tourists waited to see if they'd be allowed back in to visit one of the world's most prestigious museums, home to the Mona Lisa. Others looked on anxiously. The military the most close, it seems, to fire to defend against the aggression. One of the militaires was severely wounded in the cuir chevelu, and the military fired five bullets, wounding seriously the attacker, notably with a bullet in the stomach. The attacker is alive, the soldiers are currently in charge of taking him, and after verification of the contents of the sack, Des deux sacs qu'il qu avait sur le dos, nous avons constaté qu'il n'y avait pas d'explosifs et qu'il n'y avait pas de menaces. Et donc le périmètre vient à l'instant d'être récupéré par la police judiciaire. Yeah, Charlotte, in fact, uh, we're getting uh, more information. Uh, as you're there in Paris giving us this live uh, report over the phone, we understand, according to the Paris police chief, uh, the Louvre attacker wielded a machete, uh, shouting, as you said, Charlotte, Aloua Akbar. Uh, they say the attacker was carrying two rucksacks, but neither contained explosives. And the head of the Paris police now saying the Louvre attacker's remarks lead them to believe that he wanted to carry out a terrorist attack. Uh, Charlotte Dubensky will join you very soon for more updates. Thanks very much for that. Scuffles erupted outside New York University, where prominent Trump supporter and co-founder of Vice Media, Gavin McInnes, was speaking. Now, the university said it condemned the riots, adding that it regretted the fact that a peaceful protest had been hijacked. And political activist Scott Pressler says liberal protests are increasingly being taken over by the extreme left. If you are unhappy with your government, there are ways to take back control that don't include pepper spraying people in the face, destroying property, and punching people. There are better ways to achieve what you want in the world without violence. The new U.S. Defense Secretary arrived in Japan for the second leg of an Asian tour with a clear aim, reassurance. As candidate, Donald Trump had threatened to pull U.S. troops out of Japan and South Korea unless they paid more for their presence, suggesting they could arm themselves with nuclear weapons. James Mattis told Prime Minister Shinzo Abe that America's commitments remained unchanged. Earlier on Friday, Mattis was given a ceremonial honor guard in South Korea, where again, the emphasis was on the continuity of a long-standing alliance. Beyond tweeting that a planned North Korean intercontinental ballistic missile launch, quote, won't happen, any Trump doctrine on North Korea has yet to emerge. But Mattis made clear that the United States' extended nuclear deterrence remained in place to protect its allies. Any attack on the United States or on our allies will be defeated and any use of nuclear weapons would be met with a response that would be effective and overwhelming. 
The two allies also discussed additional defensive measures to counter North Korea's nuclear and missile threats, including deployment of the U.S. missile defense system, THAAD. The THAAD battery is expected to be deployed on South Korean soil by the middle of this year, at the earliest. South Korea's defense chief said the meeting shows how committed the allies are to countering North Korea's threats. These South Korea-U.S. defense talks show that our resolve to counter North Korea's nuclear and missile threats is unwavering. Due to North Korea's threatening rhetoric and destabilizing behavior, we are taking defensive steps like deploying the highly effective THAAD anti-missile unit to the Republic of Korea to protect its people and our troops that stand beside our ally. Well, Mattis reiterated that the THAAD battery is aimed at countering only North Korea's threats and emphasized that the system is purely defensive in nature. Now, those remarks were likely directed toward China. Uh, Beijing is deeply opposed to the deployment and claims it would encroach on China's national interest and destabilize the region. The THAAD battery is expected to be deployed on South Korean soil by the middle of this year at the earliest. And South Korea's defense chief said the meeting shows how committed the allies are uh, to countering North Korea's threats. Uh, I don't think we should take anything off the table, sir. The next four years are key. North Korea could well perfect an ICBM that could hit mainland U.S., experts say. Kim Jong-un claims he's already miniaturized a nuclear warhead to put on top. It's not known if that's accurate. They could also perfect launching a missile from a submarine and a mobile launcher. Worrying milestones, all potentially falling within President Trump's term. Rex Tillerson enters the State Department to polite applause, facing a host of international controversies that have come to light in just the last 24 hours. First, President Donald Trump's top security advisor issued a warning to Iran that could lead to military action. Then we learned President Trump threatened the Mexican president that he might send in U.S. forces to find what the president called, quote, bad hombres. The White House says he was joking. The Prime Minister of Australia wasn't laughing after his phone call with the President, where President Trump hung up after calling it his worst phone call with a world leader. Australia is a longtime U.S. ally. And the Treasury Department is taking the controversial step of revising some sanctions against a Russian intelligence agency. The White House downplayed the significance. It's a fairly common practice. All of this has many career foreign service officers on edge, but the message from their new boss, they will be listened to. You have accumulated knowledge and experience that cannot be replicated anywhere else. Your wisdom, your work ethic, and patriotism is as important as ever. And as your secretary, I will be proud to draw upon all these qualities in my decision making. It's still an open question if the president will be listening to his secretary of state. But we do know he is listening to Stephen Bannon, his senior advisor, a former radio host whose recordings have come under new scrutiny. In one, he predicts a war with China in five to ten years and another war in the Middle East in the near term. You have an expansionist Islam and you have an expansionist China, right? They, they, they are motivated, they're arrogant, they, uh, they, 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 they're on the march and they think the Judeo-Christian West is on the retreat. It's obvious by his policy choices that President Trump is following Bannon's lead. If Secretary Tillerson has any chance of success, his very first order of business on this, his very first day, try to change that. What's making America less safe is to have a white supremacist named to the National Security Council as a permanent member while the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the director of national intelligence are told, uh, don't call us, we'll call you. You're no longer permanent members, we'll call you when we need whatever judgment they make about when they want them to come back. This is, it's a stunning thing that a white supremacist ban would be a permanent member of National Security Council and dismissing <clears throat> Chairman of Joint Chiefs and the Director of National Security, excuse me, National Intelligence as permanent members. Look, of course the president should get to decide who advises him, but I think it is bad judgment and it reflects a wrong priority to place weight on what a political advisor says rather than on your military and intelligence professionals. These are consequential matters of life and death and politics shouldn't have any part in them. We're able to get into Arab America the is in full crisis mode. We will win because we can't afford to lose, and we must fight with a ferocious courage and daring vision. 
that might put us in danger today, but promises a better future for our children tomorrow. Thank you. In Dearborn, the epicenter of Michigan's Arab and Muslim American community, more than a thousand people gather at an emergency town hall meeting. My mom is actually back home and she's visiting. She is an American citizen, but I'm just worried she won't be able to come back because something, something new will come up. Chaos and perhaps a nationwide struggle for the heart of the country that once welcomed them. A civil liberties group has accused U.S. President Donald Trump of violating the religious freedom of some nationals from the seven Muslim countries barred from entering the United States. The American Civil Liberties Union filed a lawsuit in a California federal court. The suit also accuses Trump of violating the free speech and due process rights of those affected by the ban. The lead plaintiffs in the lawsuit are three student visa holders, including a Yemeni national who left the United States and is unable to go back. The lawsuit is the latest in a series of actions challenging the executive order signed by the president. International aid group Oxfam America, as well as the state of Massachusetts, joined the chorus of criticism earlier this week against Trump's executive order on immigrants. I will get rid of and totally destroy the Johnson Amendment, an amendment pushed by Lyndon Johnson many years ago. President Donald Trump has his eyes set on the Johnson Amendment. But if you're blanking on what that is, don't feel bad. We've got you covered. In 1954, then-Senator Lyndon B. Johnson introduced a change to the tax code that prohibits 501c3 nonprofits from directly or indirectly endorsing or donating to political candidates. If they do, they lose their exempt status. That includes universities and churches. But the interesting thing is, it had nothing to do with churches when it was introduced. In 1954, a conservative nonprofit sent out materials telling folks to vote for Johnson's primary opponent, which didn't sit well with him. Basically, Johnson proposed the ban in part to protect his own seat, and there was no church involved at all. But that's where the controversy is now. Trump's argument about the Johnson Amendment is that it infringes on the, quote, right to worship according to our own beliefs, that campaigning is a way to put your religious beliefs in action. But the Johnson Amendment hasn't really stopped religious organizations from endorsing candidates. For example, in 2000, Jerry Falwell told churchgoers to vote, quote, for the Bush of your choice. And the IRS has very rarely punished any church for political statements. Because the amendment is part of the tax code, technically, the only way to get rid of it would be through the legislative process. But as president, Trump could tell the IRS not to enforce it if he really wanted to. President Trump delivered a brief but stern message to Iran from the Oval Office. They're not behaving. The Trump administration is backing that warning with new sanctions on Iran, hitting 25 individuals and companies connected to that country's ballistic missile program, punishment for Tehran's missile launch from last weekend. While officials caution the sanctions won't impact the Iran nuclear deal brokered by the Obama administration, the White House is weighing its options. Today, the U.S. sanctioned 25 individuals and entities that provide support to Iran's ballistic missile program and the Islamic Revolutionary Quds Force. He doesn't take options off the table, but he understands the impact of something like that. The, the sanctions today, I think, are going to be very, very um, strong and impactful. And I hope that Iran realizes that after the provocative measures that they've taken, that they understand that this president, this administration is not going to sit back, take it lightly. In response, Iran has said that it's going to impose its own restrictions on the U.S. Earlier, we spoke to former Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran, Amir Abdullayan. He said that if the nuclear agreement collapses, Iran will take immediate action. The nuclear agreement with Tehran was cemented in a U.N. resolution. So it's an international agreement. Some of Donald Trump's statements about the possible breaking of the agreement have met a harsh reaction from his Iranian counterpart. If the U.S. does decide to rip up the agreement, we'll burn what's left. So we'll watch Trump's decision closely. Our answer will be effective and immediate. Iran is unmoved by the threats as we derive security from our people. We'll never initiate war, but we can only rely on our own means of defense. And he had promised that he will put an end to the nuclear agreement. Well, he realized now that this is something that is next to impossible. He is going to make up for that 
by imposing uh, sanctions, in my judgment, would be economic sanctions. On the other hand, the Iranians have a record of uh, being tenacious, uh, showing a certain uh, national pride. They are not going to uh, take it lie down, so they will uh, respond, but the response will be limited. First of all, uh when you're talking about the United States Treasury, you're not talking about the Treasury. You're talking about one department in the Treasury that is dominated by Jews, like uh, Stuart Eisenstadt was one of them. This is the group that uh, orchestrated the looting operation against Switzerland. They're notorious uh, for uh, being a rogue operation that runs its own show here. Uh, this is what's happening here uh, in the chaos that has followed uh, the Trump inauguration. I'm saying chaos because it's becoming more and more apparent here that there is no coherent program uh, behind the Trump administration. The people who voted for him voted for America first. America first had a definite meaning. It meant uh, re reinvigorating the uh, manufacturing base and getting out of foreign entanglements. It meant a much more modest foreign policy. Well, it turns out that what America First meant in Trump's mind is completely different than what it meant in the mind of the average American. What it means in Trump's mind right now looks as if it's going to be the New Yorker's view of the world imposed on the rest of the world. This famous uh, cartoon cover of New Yorker uh, is called The New Yorker's View of the World. Uh, basically, it's got, uh, you know, the streets of uh, New York, 7th Avenue, 5th Avenue, 7th Avenue, then there's the Hudson River, and then there's California. So basically, there's nothing in between. Um, this is not completely accurate, but it, if you to put it in the other direction, you would have some sort of understanding of Trump's view of the world. He didn't have a coherent understanding of foreign policy. Now that he's in power, he's going to the default setting of uh, New York, which is basically the Jewish understanding of the foreign policy, and he's uh, going headlong uh, in that direction in, a, in setting a course that no one knows and no one knows where it's going to end. I don't know who this guy is, but we expect to be cutting a lot out of Dodd Frank because, frankly, I have so many people, friends of mine, that have nice businesses. They can't borrow money. They just can't get any money because the banks I just won't let them borrow because of the rules and regulations in Dodd Frank. Uh, we have a full uh, agenda, uh, unlike a lot of other meetings uh, that happen of this general type. Uh, we're we're going to cover some of the immigration things. Uh, we're going to cover uh, regulatory relief. We're going to cover tax and trade, uh, women in the workplace, uh, infrastructure, and education. And uh, e each of those areas will we'll get suggestions, ways to make things happen, happen faster, uh, to improve the country. Good morning, and these executive actions are going to thrill congressional Republicans who have long wanted to roll back what they say are burdensome regulations within the Dodd-Frank Act. Democrats, meanwhile, say that those regulations are in place to prevent another financial collapse like the ones we saw in 2007 and 2008. Dodd-Frank was signed into law by President Obama back in 2010. It created a consumer protection agency and it reined in some mortgage practices and trading that led to the collapse. Senior White House officials, though, say that this executive order is going to direct the Treasury Secretary to review Dodd-Frank and make recommendations about how to change or unwind it. The president described his intentions on Monday during a meeting with small business owners. Dodd-Frank is a disaster. We're going to be doing a big number on Dodd-Frank. President Trump's other executive action will halt new fiduciary rules that were set to go into effect in April, meant to crack down on payments and hidden fees from financial planners. Again, Democrats say those rules were there to protect consumers. Republicans say they hurt competition. President Trump's choice for Treasury Secretary is Steve Mnuchin. He has made stripping down Dodd-Frank one of his top priorities. He's expected to be confirmed within the next week or two. And Republicans are so intent on stripping it down as well that the Senate has already voted just this morning, Anthony, to do away with a key regulation buried in Dodd-Frank.
Today, we're assigning core principles for regulating the United States financial system. Doesn't get much bigger than that, right? President Donald Trump signed two executive orders Friday that seek to cut back some of the financial regulations established during the Obama administration. The first offers guideline principles for the financial regulatory system. In previewing the executive order, White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer called the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act a disastrous policy. The act was passed in response to the 2008 recession. It imposed new regulations for financial institutions including requiring them to conduct annual stress tests to make sure they can survive a financial crisis. But Republicans in the White House say Dodd-Frank is deeply flawed. That's hindering our markets, reducing the availability of credit, and crippling our economy's ability to grow and create jobs. During his campaign, Trump said he'd be for getting rid of Dodd-Frank. The regulators are running the banks, and that's why our country, I mean, people can't borrow money today. The second executive order directs the Department of Labor to reconsider its fiduciary rule, which was supposed to go into effect in April. Boiled down, the rule makes financial advisors legally obligated to work in their clients' best interests and disclose fees and conflicts of interests up front. The White House says the rule limits services available to investors. Not surprisingly, Democrats slam Trump's executive order, saying he's putting Wall Street ahead of the American people. President Donald Trump's administration said unexpectedly on Thursday that new Jewish settlements may not be helpful for peace in the Middle East. A White House statement read, While we don't believe the existence of settlements is an impediment to peace, the construction of new settlements or the expansion of existing settlements beyond their current borders may not be helpful in achieving that goal. The statement came just hours after Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed to establish the first new West Bank settlement in over two decades. That statement by Press Secretary Sean Spicer. And of course, you have to take this into the context of what's happening in Israel today. You saw the eviction of settlers from this illegal outpost in Anona. Uh, in uh, the West Bank. And so I think that the Israelis have been making this announcement, you know, because really everything is uh, about local politics and domestic politics in Israel. That was that announcement was about. But for the White House to come out and say, you've made your announcements, let's cut it out now, is really significant. In a telephone conversation on Wednesday, U.S. President Donald Trump told his Mexican counterpart that he would be forced to deploy troops into Mexico unless the country brought organized crime under control. The news has shocked Mexicans, who have felt themselves victimized since Trump's arrival in the White House. In the transcript of the two presidents' conversation, Trump referred to Mexico's, quote, bad hombres, a problem in which many here feel the U.S. is complicit. Yet not every Mexican seems to think the deployment of U.S. troops would be a bad idea. The Mexican army has done very little to fight organized crime, and many of us live constantly in fear. Perhaps the U.S. army could achieve what our own forces haven't been able to. More than Trump's economic and military threats, many here are disappointed in the anti-Mexican sentiment that is growing in the U.S. The Mexican public's horror at the idea of President Trump sending U.S. troops south of the border has quickly turned into indignation. How seriously the government has taken the threat remains unclear, but it nevertheless represents a further deterioration in the two countries' relationship. Toy robots, educational robots, industrial robots and domestic robots. The range here is extraordinary. A grill bot can now clean your barbecue. A lawn bot can cut the grass. There's even a famous robot. And of course, it's the advances in humanoid robots, which really grab the attention. Last month, the World Economic Forum in Davos heard gloomy predictions of millions of human jobs being lost as... Automation sweeps the industrial world. Robots replacing humans in fields as diverse as manufacturing, transportation, even medicine and social care. And standing here at this expo in the midst of this automated warehouse environment, it's not difficult to believe that could be true. Its artificial intelligence can not only tell the age of the human in front of it, it can also recognize that person's emotions. Uh, the biggest threat to humanity 
Elon Musk said it was. Some of the most interesting parts of the exhibition are the spaces given over to observe robots working in what would be their natural habitats. A typical home has been recreated for the consumer robots to prove their purpose, for example. But what's clear is there will always be a place for the real humans in this increasingly robotic world. FJCU police sending out these pictures of the two who they say were car hopping. This happened on the second floor of Garage B in the South Village area and the suspects police say were in that garage for almost two hours. If stuff from your car was stolen, if you recognize the people in these images, you are asked to call university police. Our first look at the duo accused of a smash and grab at a Valley dentist office. You saw the video first here yesterday on ABC 15 mornings. You can see those two get in there super fast. They grab the computers and take off. And within hours, they were caught. A former student told Anne Arundel County Police back in October they were involved with Wilbur Hildebrand and sent naked photos to him. Detectives searched his home and took several electronic devices for evidence. Hildebrand was arrested yesterday. He's now facing sexual abuse of a minor and other related charges. Northwestern DA spokeswoman Mary Carey told 22 News Amherst Police arrested 29-year-old John Nemec of Sunderland on Thursday. Nemec was arraigned today on charges of conspiracy to commit home invasion and conspiracy to commit robbery. 25-year-old Patrick Bemben of Hadley has already been charged in the incident. Three months later, and deputies are still on the hunt for two masked gunmen who robbed a Lehigh Acres motel. Police say it was on November 22nd that they rushed into the microtel on Business Way and started demanding money. Moments later, police say one of them jumped the counter, stole money from the register, and an employee's purse before taking off. If you know anything, if you recognize the people in these images, you are asked to call Crime Stoppers and you don't have to give your name. French police evacuated people from Paris's Louvre Museum and rapidly secured the area after an attack by a man armed with a machete. The attack took place in a shopping mall outside the Louvre, one of the most visited museums in the world. About a thousand people inside were moved to safe areas. by the extreme left. If you are unhappy with your government, there are ways to take back control that don't include pepper spraying people in the face, destroying property, and punching people. There are better ways to achieve what you want in the world without violence. The new US Defense Secretary arrived in Japan for the second leg of an Asian tour with a clear aim, reassurance. As candidate, Donald Trump had threatened to pull U.S. troops out of Japan and South Korea unless they paid more for their presence, suggesting they could arm themselves with nuclear weapons. James Mattis told Prime Minister Shinzo Abe that America's commitments remained unchanged. Earlier on Friday, Mattis was given a ceremonial honor guard in South Korea, where again the emphasis was on the continuity of a long-standing alliance. Beyond tweeting that a planned North Korean intercontinental ballistic missile launch, quote, won't happen, any Trump doctrine on North Korea has yet to emerge. But Mattis made clear that the United States extended nuclear deterrence remained in place to protect its allies. Any attack on the United States or on our allies will be defeated and any use of nuclear weapons would be met with a response that would be effective and overwhelming. The two allies also discussed additional defensive measures to counter North Korea's nuclear and missile threats, including deployment of the U.S. missile defense system, THAAD. The THAAD battery is expected to be deployed on South Korean soil by the middle of this year, at the earliest. South Korea's defense chief said the meeting shows how committed the allies are to countering North Korea's threats. These South Korea-U.S. defense talks show that our resolve to counter North Korea's nuclear and missile threats is unwavering. Due to North Korea's threatening rhetoric and destabilizing behavior, we are taking defensive steps 
like deploying the highly effective THAAD anti-missile unit to the Republic of Korea to protect its people and our troops that stand beside our ally. Well, Mattis reiterated that the THAAD battery is aimed at countering only North Korea's threats and emphasized that the system is purely defensive in nature. Now, those remarks were likely directed toward China. Uh, Beijing is deeply opposed to the deployment and claims it would encroach on China's national interest and destabilize the region. The THAAD battery is expected to be deployed on South Korean soil by the middle of this year at the earliest. And South Korea's defense chief said the meeting shows how... Police say they haven't identified the man or established a motive. A second person was arrested, but it's unclear whether they were linked to the incident. Some tourists waited to see if they'd be allowed back in to visit one of the world's most prestigious museums, home to the Mona Lisa. Others looked on anxiously. The military the most close, it seems, has shot to defend against the aggression. One of the has been severely injured in the cheek and the military has shot five balls, blessing seriously the attacker, notably with a ball in the stomach. The attacker is alive, the soldiers are currently trying to take him in charge, and after verification of the content of the sack, Des deux sacs qu'il qu avait sur le dos, nous avons constaté qu'il n'y avait pas d'explosifs et qu'il n'y avait pas de menaces. Et donc le périmètre vient à l'instant d'être récupéré par la police judiciaire. Yeah, Charlotte, in fact, uh, we're getting uh, more information uh, as you're there in Paris giving us this live uh, report over the phone. We understand, according to the Paris police chief, uh, the Louvre attacker wielded a machete, uh, shouting, as you said, Charlotte, Aloua Akbar. Uh, they say the attacker was carrying two rucksacks, but neither contained explosives. And the head of the Paris police now saying the Louvre attacker's remarks lead them to believe that he wanted to carry out a terrorist attack. Uh, Charlotte Dubensky will join you very soon for more updates. Thanks very much for that. Scuffles erupted outside New York University, where prominent Trump supporter and co-founder of Vice Media, Gavin McInnes, was speaking. Now, the university said it condemned the riots, adding that it regretted the fact that a peaceful protest had been hijacked. And political activist Scott Pressler says liberal protests are increasingly being taken over. Committed the allies are uh, to countering North Korea's threats. Uh, I don't think we should take anything off the table, sir. The next four years are key. North Korea could well perfect an ICBM that could hit mainland U.S., experts say. Kim Jong-un claims he's already miniaturized a nuclear warhead to put on top. It's not known if that's accurate. They could also perfect launching a missile from a submarine and a mobile launcher. Worrying milestones, all potentially falling within President Trump's term. Rex Tillerson enters the State Department to polite applause, facing a host of international controversies that have come to light in just the last 24 hours. First, President Donald Trump's top security advisor issued a warning to Iran that could lead to military action. Then we learned President Trump threatened the Mexican president that he might send in U.S. forces to find what the president called, quote, bad hombres. The White House says he was joking. The Prime Minister of Australia wasn't laughing after his phone call with the President, where President Trump hung up after calling it his worst phone call with a world leader. Australia is a longtime U.S. ally. And the Treasury Department is taking the controversial step of revising some sanctions against a Russian intelligence agency. The White House downplayed the significance. It's a fairly common practice. All of this has many career foreign service officers on edge, but the message from their new boss, they will be listened to. You have accumulated knowledge and experience that cannot be replicated anywhere else. Your wisdom, your work ethic, and patriotism is as important as ever. And as your secretary, I will be proud to draw upon all these qualities in my decision making.
It's still an open question if the president will be listening to his secretary of state. But we do know he is listening to Stephen Bannon, his senior advisor, a former radio host whose recordings have come under new scrutiny. In one, he predicts a war with China in five to ten years and another war in the Middle East in the near term. You have an expansionist Islam and you have an expansionist China, right? They, they, they are motivated. They're arrogant. They, uh, they, 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 they're on the march and they think the Judeo-Christian West is on the retreat. It's obvious by his policy choices that President Trump is following Bannon's lead. If Secretary Tillerson has any chance of success, his very first order of business on this, his very first day, try to change that. What's making America less safe is to have a white supremacist named to the National Security Council as a permanent member while the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the director of national intelligence are told, uh, don't call us, we'll call you. You're no longer permanent members, we'll call you when we need whatever judgment they make about when they want them to come back. This is, it's a stunning thing that a white supremacist, Bannon, would be a permanent member of National Security Council and dismissing <clears throat> Chairman of Joint Chiefs and the Director of National Security, uh, excuse me, National Intelligence as permanent members. Look, of course the president should get to decide who advises him, but I think it is bad judgment and it reflects a wrong priority to place weight on what a political advisor says rather than on your military and intelligence professionals. These are consequential matters of life and death and politics shouldn't have any part in them. We're able to get into Arab America is in full crisis mode. 